Congress. Um, I know that at, 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 at least two of them send their regrets because there's uh, a conference in Springfield this morning about economic development. Um, and so um, they felt it was important to be there. Uh, it includes the regional planning commissions from two counties and the economic development people from two counties. Um, so they send their apologies. Um, so we are, this is, this is the last week before crossover. So we have four more days before bills need to leave the committee of jurisdiction on the House side to get to the Senate or on the Senate side to get to the House. Um, and so the, in general, in general, um, like the rest of the world, we do the easy things first. So all of the bills that could come out of committees on, on unanimous votes have passed. And now we're down to the things that have some um, disputes. Um, in my committee, we have been working, uh, so I, um, as you may recall, I serve on human services. Um, and we've been working a lot this year on issues related to elders. Um, one, one bill that we passed that will be on, up on the floor this week is to have a, um, a, a, a group to really look at how we have a, an overarching plan for how we take care of elders. There is, um, the federal government passed many years ago, I want to say 30 or 40 years ago, something called the Older Americans Act. And those of you who have had any uh, contact with the area agencies on aging, that's the, what we call the triple A's. That's, that, that was, that's the umbrella that kind of set those groups up. Um, but we are concerned about trying to make sure that we have um, uh, integration of services between the triple A's and um, uh, visiting nurse associations and um, state government, um, the uh, Department for Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living. So this is so this group over will have 18 months to look at how we put together a, uh, a, a Vermont elder Vermonters. What are we calling it? Uh, uh, we keep changing. We, we keep changing whether we're, whether we're elders or seniors or um, I think it's old. I think it will be an older Vermonters Act. Are you prepping? Is that a new one? We we avoid that whenever, whenever possible. Um, um, actually, uh, he likes uh, um, uh, geezers. That's uh, so that's the only thing. The other, um, but the, the one of the one of the meteor pieces that we've been working on separately has to do with the oversight of nursing homes. Um, I don't know if you noticed in the news um, last fall, there was a rather precipitous closing of a nursing home in the White River area called Brookside. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when we drilled down on that, what we found was that um, basically they had run out of money and no one had noticed. Um, and as we brought in to our committee the folks who theoretically regulate nursing homes, everybody did that. Um, so we current under current law, we have um, we have a procedure for um, the Green Mountain Care Board that regulates hospitals to look at the transfer of ownership of a of a nursing home, but. Um, there are real, there are serious questions about whether that adds anything to the process. It makes it very expensive and basically drives up price costs. But in any event, once once the transfer has happened, no one thereafter looks at the books. Um, and so we are um, trying to put we are trying to put together a bill this week that will direct the um, the relevant players to get together and figure out how we work this into the licensing. So so nursing nursing homes are licensed by by Dale by the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living, but but they the people who um, inspect the nursing homes are nurses. So they look at things like patient care and bed, bed, bed sores and staffing levels and whether the food is, is, is nutritious and served hot and things like that. But they, they don't have financial expertise. And they, they don't have the same thing that the hospital has, where they come in once a year or every so often and 
do an overview of everything. They yes, yes, but it doesn't seem to include finances as as at, say, at the current at the current time. Uh -huh. So that's so that's what we're working on right now. Is we we, we feel like um, uh, we what we found is that um, um, that that other states have seen the same kind of issue when they have they they have, they call for something like an early warning system, and so that's that's what we're we're, we're hoping that they're going to be able to pull together. So we are. Um, we're going to have a bill this week to charge charge them to come forward with a plan about how this gets done. It does not seem to be um, an appropriate job for the Green Mountain Care Board because the, the, the so we have something in Vermont called the Certificate of Need um, that once upon a time was done by one group and when, when Green Mountain Care Board was set up it, it was taken over by them. And the concept of Certificate of Need is to make sure that we don't have 10 MRI machines, you know, one in Bethel and one in Stockbridge and one in Randolph, um, and have them competing for business. So, so it's it's really about you know how do we how do we appropriate healthcare resources in in a in a way that is um, that that increases access without also increasing cost. So we're trying. Um, but to have them look at these transfers, transfers of ownership, um, you know, so, okay, so they do, so they get financials on the buyers who are often out of state <coughs> companies. Um, and, uh, and often, it's as, as, we, as with most businesses, and these are, keep in mind that nursing homes, I think with, with the exception of the veterans home, all nursing homes in Vermont are for-profit businesses, which is fine. That's their entitlement to do that. But, but as most of you who are in business know, you often separate ownership of the land from the business. So you you know you set up a you set up a partnership to own the the land the property the real estate, and then the corporation the, the business is a corporation and leases from from the um, from the people who own the property, um, and. There's again. There's nothing wrong with that with that setup, as long as, um, as as long as the entity that is actually operating the business is is solvent. And so that's so we're going to be we're going to be trying to figure out how we put how we put some constraints around that to make to make that because what happens um, when a nursing home closes abruptly is that you end up with very frail people who are then moved precipitously, possibly hours from where their family is. Um, so, right. so A, they probably shouldn't be moved at all, and B, we're, we are re reducing the, op the possibility that they can have meaningful contact with their family. So it really is a serious question. And with, um, with Vermont's population aging, this is an issue that will only, only continue to be <coughs> become more important. A um, couple of things in the news last week. You might have heard that. Um, so I, one of the, I also serve on the um, Corrections Oversight Committee. I'm sorry. It's, I, it used to be called that. Now it's called the Justice Oversight Committee. Um, we mostly meet only in the off, off session. Um, but we met this week because we've had, uh, Vermont has, as I, I think I've talked about before, we have some uh, prisoners who are housed out of state. Once upon a time, you heard about them being in Kentucky, and then uh, for a couple of years, they were in Michigan. And Michigan um, uh, cut off our contract rather abruptly last year uh, because they had other biz they had better, 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 better business. Um, and so Vermont entered, in, entered into an agreement with the state of Pennsylvania um, to have, we have about 250 prisoners who are, who are currently housed in Pennsylvania, um, interestingly, when we when we were dealing with private private prison uh, companies, which a lot of us were not real happy about, we did at least have contracts with them, so we could say, you have to do this and you have to do that, and you have to do you know you have to provide programming and and make sure they get enough exercise and and this is what we want for medical care. Dealing with another state, we don't have that power. Um, the state has its own. Uh, its own internal rules about how its prisoners are kept. In the same way that if, if Vermont took in a prisoner, and, and we do from other states, sometimes um, sometimes states take take people prisoners from other states because you don't want the policeman 
who shot somebody to be in the same place with the with the criminals who hate him. So you might so there so there are reasons that we move people to prisons where where a they will be in um, uh, safer and everyone else will be safer. So that there are some that that tends to be done on a one to one basis. But when that happens, whoever is in a Vermont prison is under Vermont law. And so the same thing has happened to us in Pennsylvania. And, um, and the result has been not great. Number one, we've had three people die, uh, two of them on, on site and one within days of, of being sent back to Vermont. Um, was that their fault? Would they have died anyway? I don't know. Those, those deaths are all being investigated. But it was three deaths in about six months, so it was dramatic. Um, and second, we've discovered that the particular facility where the Vermont prisoners are is, is for um, detainees. Now, um, if, you, if you've ever watched Law and Order, you know that, they go, that, that, pe that they, go, they go to visit people at Rikers Island. Well, Rikers Island is a jail. It's a county jail. And most states have, have a difference between jails and prisons. So, so if I'm charged with a crime, I go and I sit in jail waiting for trial if I don't get bail. Um, but I don't go to prison until after I'm, um, <coughs> and, and until after I'm convicted. In Vermont, because because we have so few people in any of those categories, we have what what we call an integrated system, where everybody is in prison. So so if you get picked up on a Friday night for uh, uh, for drunk driving and they decide not to send you home, you could spend the weekend in prison. Um, and the particular facility that um, Pennsylvania has been using called Camp Hill for the Vermont um, prisoners is a detention facility. And what that means in practical effect is that, is that there's no programming there. So, so, the, so our prisoners are spending, I think it's seven to, um, um, uh, all, but, all but five hours a day in, in their cells. So they, they, they get up for three meals, and they get out for an hour of exercise and, and a shower, and that's it. Um, and these are the people that we send to the out-of-state facility, for the most part, are people who have fairly long terms. We don't. If you have, if you're in for, for three months, you don't go. To, you don't go out of state. Um, but if you're in for ten years, that that's very likely where you end up. So it's it, it is the the programming, the jobs don't exist, and um, and the medical care has been um, um, not up to our standards. So um, so our committee this week um, directed the commissioner of uh, corrections to get the prisoners out of Camp Hill. If it's possible that Pennsylvania can put them into a better facility, that, that, that may happen. Um, but she is now going to be trying to figure out where else they're going to go. And that, that was in the news, and I thought I'd talk about that a little bit. The other thing that was in the news last week was the Coyote Bill. I don't know if people paid attention to that. That was, um, we spent four hours on the House floor talking about coyote hunting. Um, the bill itself was a, um, a kind of miscellaneous uh, fish and wildlife bill. Um, but after talking about it for years, um, the committee decided to recommend that, that coyote contests be um, um, made illegal. Not, so it's, we, have, we have completely open season on coyotes in Vermont. You can shoot a coyote any day of the year. You can always shoot. Um, a, um, a, a pest on your property. Um, so none of that changes. What changes under this bill is is that you can't say, oh, let's have let's 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 spend Sunday having having a contest and see who can come up with, with the, the most um, coyote tails. Um, and um, and so it's illegal to, to organize a contest and it's illegal to participate in one. What was what took the most time? Hello, Senator! Yay! Come join us. So you're the thing out of this that um, there are a lot of school buses that are picking up children, so we need more of those. Um, I'll just finish up and then I'll turn it over to you. Um, so uh, but one of one of the so once once we had sort of we had, you know, a majority wanted wanted to ban the contests. Um, then there was a question of what, what the penalties would be. 
And the committee had decided to plug into um, an existing penalty provision that applied to big game and extinct species. And a lot of people thought that that didn't make a lot of sense. So um, I, I confess that, that um, I flipped. I voted, I voted for it one day, and I voted against it the next. Um, the, um, um, the, in the meantime, um, uh, somebody came up with a compromise that um, that, that capped the jail time, so that so the, 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 the penalty. So the what the committee had recommended would have had possible jail time for a first offense. And since a lot of us are trying to reduce the number of people who are in prison for for the wrong reasons, um, that was that was that was troubling. And so the compromise was that the penalty provision was moved so that it, so the penalty for organizing or participating in a coyote contest is a fine, and a fine, um, and um, and points on your hunting license, which uh, effectively works works out to a suspension for a year for participating and three years for organizing. That was the Coyote Bill. Interesting, because I understand that's coming. I think, I think you're going to get it. Yes. And I've actually had a lot of calls about it, um, starting mixed in with all the other calls that are coming. There have been quite a few Coyote calls. When they first started coming, I thought, what bill is this? It's not It's not in the Senate. It's been in the House. So we didn't even have the bill. So, yeah. so welcome, Senator Nitka. Thank you. I apologize for being late. Um, I was very to see you. I was surprised to see you come through the door. I was there are thinking of all the roads between here and yours. And yeah, they weren't so bad. Okay. But um, my, my two yeah. colleagues, um, Alison Carson and Dick McCormick, who I know is loyally here, um, they're in, let's see, Springfield at the, um, what is it? Well, it's, it's the whole regional commission, all kinds of groups that get together and have an event there. Every Monday there are a lot of events all around the county, so it's certainly hard to get to all of them. But anyway, I'm glad to be here. I haven't seen you in a while. And uh, are there specific topics that people want to talk about? I'll give you, okay. I think uh, the efficiency of time, this meeting is about listening to the people present. Yes. Uh, and hearing what the reality is of what's going on. And, li and listening, listening to yeah. the reality. Yes. Right? And responding to the realities. Yes. Um, I don't know whether everyone in this room looked at last month's recording. We're, you're being recorded at work. Good morning. <laughs> but I timed the uh, recording. Yes. And it was amazing how much time we listened rather than had a chance to speak. Uh, Sandy Haas attended the meeting and took notes with uh, which we expected there would be responses by the notes she took and as of today um, responses to those requests are not happening. So rather than here, I'm not here for a dissertation about the Coyote Law and an hour of my life in the morning listening without being able to communicate my concerns and I think there's other people in the room that would like to communicate their concerns before we run out of time and one of the representatives says I'm done Neil I'm not sure. so I'm not sure what the message is and what you're the saying message is I would like everyone to ask questions specific to what their individual needs are to Sandy Haas and you and respond appropriately rather than an hour of listening to what's going on. No one asked any questions about prisoners. Well, Bob, I think, well, I think they're just uh, abiding by tradition. We've been doing this the same way for 30 years. Right. And uh, what we ask is generally the senators to speak for it as long as they want to speak on whatever they're doing or whatever they think is significant. And then we ask the reps to do the same thing. And then after that, we ask questions. So I don't, I don't think we're doing anything different than what we've done forever. That, that's, that, looks, that, that looks obvious. Well, is that... The Time to break tradition? Uh, I'm sorry. I, 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 if, if somebody wants to change the rules, I'd be happy to entertain that thought. But uh, in the interest of time... Uh, well, maybe I'm we should extend I, the meeting until 9.30. 
Yeah, assuming, assuming we're they have time to stay here. As long as, as, long know. as somebody wants right. to stay here. We were here, I think, last week till 20 after night. Uh, last last month, month, excuse me. Um, right, but if you look at the recording, it, it was uh, way over balanced. I mean, it's okay, let's continue on. Okay, Mr. M M Moderator. <laughs> Sandy, you started with about the nursing homes. Would you, would you let you know, the, what? Uh, Alice was just beginning her. I thought she was done, weren't you? I, I haven't spoken yet. Oh, uh, other than to say. Go, go ahead. No, I'll back up. But I don't mind. Um, I have to admit, I always am get informed here when I hear Sandy speak as well, because we don't always hear every single thing that's going on in the house. So it's nice, nice for me to hear Sandy speak as well. But anyway. Um, I just had a couple of items on the agenda. Sometimes when we go to these meetings, it's a good idea for me to speak about items that aren't in the press frequently that people do want to hear about. So it works out to give a little blurb and then um, speak, but I'm, I'm up to whatever. Um, I think some of the topics that I would like to just mention that people are calling me about from around the county are, one of them is the car inspections, that people are getting stuck with a check engine light on. And so, you know, we had contacted the Department of Transportation, and they're they're working on new rules for everything that are going to be in effect. Uh, I think around October, they said they they can't say exactly which date, but a lot of the things like several of the lights that are on that are not a safety issue are the things that we feel they should be addressing. Now, of course, the the check engine light could be to do with your catalytic converter and the problem with emissions. But it also could be that there's a defective light, which a lot of people have had. So there's a couple other things like that that they're working on. And there had actually been a proposal by one Senate member to suspend the fines for failing inspection, or if you don't get it fixed, you just let it go. But you know that was a little too much in terms of, obviously, you have to have safe brakes and tires and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, that's, that's something that's looming large, though, that the um, Transportation Department and the Department of Motor Vehicles are working on. Another one that people haven't heard about that a lot of people have called about are the new tax laws with regard to the changes there from the federal government. And one of them is we had had uh, a study done with regard to alimony, which is a very controversial issue, a lot of emotions on every side. Um, so that's, we had a bill before that we passed with regard to a study to try and figure out um, how, how it should be done. Is it a lifetime event that you carry, that you pay for someone even if they've remarried? It, you know, there are many different things um, going on with that. So there's a judge that's the head of it. There are, I think, um, there were no legislators on it the last time, which is, you know, fine. We'd rather a little bit folks sort this out themselves. But um, so we had to renew that because with the tax law starting January 1 of 19, the person who pays alimony will not be able to deduct it, and the person who receives it will not have to declare it. So the whole, there's there are alimony guidelines which all need to be rewritten. So we've passed something, continued that same group, could be a couple of different members, to work on that to, you know, to make sure it's fair and equitable. There's different awards depending upon the judge, and there's certainly personal circumstances that have to be taken into account. So another bill which you might want to be talking about, uh, and I'll wait to talk about it, is a bill that we passed in my Senate Judiciary Committee on Friday with regard to um, extreme risk persons. We had this bill going long before um, the Florida shooting and before the um, Fairhaven incident that was averted. And that bill um, is about removal of dangerous weapons and that takes into account, it, it does have due process in it. Many people, of course, are very concerned that someone would take somebody's property without due process. Of course, a police officer, sheriff, whoever, he's called, he's called to say a domestic violence situation, someone's been threatened with a gun and the gun's on the table, the police officer takes that now and always has. Um, but the other part of that is they can't search the house and get other guns. So with this bill, which will help with regard to suicides, which are the majority of incidents with guns in Vermont, family calls in, goes to the police, whatever, 
they can get, you know, if this is something the person is planning, you know that they went out and bought a gun, you know that they've been um, thinking about gun, very gun, you know, shooting themselves very depressed. Um, the police officer can call the court and get an order to take the gun first for 10 days, or maybe it's 14, it changes so many times. 14 days was put at that. And then you have to be back in court on that 14th day to be reviewed before the court. And then it could be um, removed for a period of, I think, 60 days or 90. You should actually look at the bill. Yeah, because that kept changing back and forth. First it was for a year, which wasn't acceptable. Then it was for 60 or 90 days. And then um, you would have a subsequent hearing if there was evidence presented that you were still a danger to yourself or you were a danger to others. For instance, the guy in Fairhaven who was posting on Facebook and all over the place that he was going to do a school shooting and that very fortunately that young woman who he sent something to um, reported it to the police and there was intervention and that was, that was averted. But so if someone was doing that kind of thing, you could get a court order, get all the armaments. This also includes the bomb making material. In other words, if some if the Boston Marathon's roommate, you know, if that bomber's roommate had been able to say, gosh, this guy's making a pressure cooker bomb, um, you know, call the police, they would be able to intervene. So it covers a lot of things. Um, it's coming on the Senate floor to, let's see, Tuesday, because we submitted it on Friday. It should, should be on notice. I think the rules are going to be suspended to have it um, put in place more quickly, and then it will have to pass the Senate. It should pass there, I think it will. It would go to the House, and the governor has sent us all a letter saying he has a list of things, but he's wanting this done before town meeting day. So what anyway. about the mental, mental health aspect of this? Definitely there's something wrong with somebody who's doing that, and they just never, ever seem to get that person to the right people. I mean, fine, you send him back home, you put him in prison, mm -hmm. he's back in society. Why isn't there a mental health intervention? I, that they have to go to mental health, that there's a place in yeah. each town that has mental health, that he gets some help. You know, that's fine. True. I think that's, that's true. true. I mean, this bill isn't really, of course, everybody that has mental health issues isn't likely to get a gun, but certainly that's an issue. And in terms of you know, there other incidents whereby someone is committed to the hospital and how it works mm -hmm. in a mental health hospital, and then um, they are released when there's a determination within, you know, the psychiatric community that they can go into the community. And the thing that I've been advocating for, which isn't really acceptable to the mental health folks, is I, if someone has been committed to um, a hospital, or if there's an also in the community kind of commitment as well, mm -hmm. for their, and if they, I always thought that so many people go out taking medication, which helps them to remain stable and is great. But the fact is, when they stop taking their medication and they're out in the public, then things can really go awry and happen some people. So I always thought that before you're discharged from the hospital, you should go through a court for the court to review it. But that's not something that's going to happen. I tried to get that last year as a, tech, as a part of another bill, and it, it would not go at all. So it's also the state of affairs in the world today with you know these these generations, you know psychologically, right. you know, it goes deeper than... Yeah, but I, I, I again, so we go back to that 39, the police went to the house 39 times. I mean, let's be serious, you know, yeah. why wasn't something done? I mean, take him and have him go to, have him talk to somebody. No, just a cop visiting your house, what is that going to do besides tell you you're a bad boy, you shouldn't do doing that, and let's not have to come back here again, but 39 times? That's to me. That would have been a real red, a red flag about the fourth time in that right. there's something wrong there. So of course, that was Florida. Here yeah, I here, know, I know. Which is good. But I mean, it's just. But, yeah. but so this bill, hopefully, you know, if that person had been posting something on the internet, um, you know, having all this trouble threatening people, mm -hmm. um, this bill, someone could intervene under this bill that, would, that is in the works. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> Have questions? Okay. Let, uh, you started your speech about uh, Brookside, the nursing home. Heidi spent five months in there. She received the best of care. It's an old place. The state wasn't doing their job at all. The inspectors would come in and they would look at, well, there's a hair on the floor. That's a violation. Uh, this person didn't have a net on her, her head. 
Nobody from the state ever asked the workers in there to speak because they were told to shut up, don't talk to the state people. Now, why? Why the state didn't wake up to see the signs that the people that bought the, uh, the Brookside had no idea of the business? And how did the state allow them to do that? And why they didn't listen to some of the workers in there, which are the best people in the world, taking care of the elderly. And I'm saying that because one of them is still helping me with, uh, with Heidi home. In other words, the state is failing miserably in a lot of these things. And they always put the blame on, oh, the workers didn't do this, they didn't do that. The state is the same, you know, we didn't do anything. So. I, I know that as a fact because I was there daily the five months that I was there. And I could see how these people were taking care of the older people. And no matter what the state would say, they are not so, it isn't so, I would tell them you are lying right through your teeth. And that's all I can say. And I know that because when Heidi was transferred from Ascotney Hospital to Brookside, it was just like day and night. She felt a lot better. Ascotney was really caring about the dollars. Couldn't care less about anything else, you know. Or they thought Heidi was gone, you know. So just do the basics and don't try to do anything more. Um, Heidi fell off her bed in Ascotney one time. They called me at nine o'clock at night. And here's the stupidest idea. I said, why did she fall? Well, we didn't have the railing up. I said, duh, why not? Well, you have to authorize that. Oh. Okay? These are the idiotic rules of the state. You know, maybe they changed it by now because I complained to the state, they got after them, you know. But why these things, why do we, oh, no, the book says no, we're not supposed to do this and we're not doing it. She's drowning. No, no, well, we're not supposed to do anything. We've got to wait till she comes up again, you know. Where are these regulations coming from? So. So I so I appreciate your uh, your note your note about speaking to the workers, and I'm going to make sure that that's part of um, what we do with the with the commissioner on this on, on the follow up that we're doing. And, well, I, and I appreciate hearing that it worked well. Um, I, I you know it's interesting that you say that they were incompetent, but she got good 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 service. So I'm, you know um, clearly they didn't know how to manage money. That, that, that part well, that was, that, that, I, I saw that from the very first day the new owners came in. The way they were talking and everything, oh, nothing is going to change, everything will be fine and all. But don't forget, it is a business. We'll throw somebody under the bus if we don't need that person. So, But it's a business. We'll take care of it. That's why the states will be stepping in. Not if there is a hair on the floor or the napkin was used once and, you know, somebody tried to use it again. Well, the other thing, I'm going to talk a little bit and then I'll shut up. Last month, I got asked you some questions. I was expecting some answers. I didn't get them about uh, DCF, Department of Children and Families, I believe. I had asked you who's responsible for the day-to-day -day operations, who oversees the workers that are working in there, who is their boss, who do they report to, who is giving them that situational authority, a little pipsqueak that works in there, that's telling me when I call them, well, sir, you better stop because I can throw punches at you too. So, I, DCF? Well, who is in charge for Medicaid? What? Oh, what? Medicaid. Right. That's oh. that's uh, that's Diva. Um, okay, Diva or whatever it is. Okay. You know. um, and so, my I, I apologize about that. I I understood that I talked to Dick about it, and he said that he would follow up because he had done it for you the first time. Well, with, with I, was, eligibility, so, I was hoping so. he'll be here today okay. because I um, sent so him a you, lengthy email, but I know he's busy and I don't expect so, to jump within So the, a your, day. your issue last week had to do with, with reapplying for, for Medicaid. Is that, is that still the issue? Well, Heidi was denied the Medicaid because she was over the allowed thing by $5,000. In other words, you've got to have only $2,000 to be in Medicaid. They claim that I didn't send all the information. I did send everything the first year, last year, and I sent the same thing again this year. Now they tell me you didn't send us the thing that she got $7,000 or $5,000. So 
So they denied Medicaid. And I said, I tried to tell them and to my lawyer, if I was trying to be a crook, why should I send this thing that you claim I didn't send you last year, the reports of investments and everything? There's no answer to that. My lawyer is trying to find out, you're off Medicaid right now. What do we do after that? Nobody in that field knows how to answer that question. And these are the state people that find the dent. They're doing a great job. And Dick also knows about VNA. Last year, I told him some situations that they screwed up an account, Heidi's account, by $3,000. And when I come up and I said, they wouldn't send the money to pay the people that were taking care of Heidi. And I said, you made a mistake. Who's going to pay for that? You. That's what they told me. And that's what I asked Dick, and Dick helped me on that. You know, and this is the attitude of these, some workers behind the desk, they're sitting there, sitting pretty, oh, and Dick also knows, he said, yeah, we hear from them, they tell us how great of a job they do, but you only listen, you don't follow up to see what they are doing. The very first day Heidi came home, we had the VNA visitors, uh, uh, nurses, uh, physical therapists, physical therapists and all. They would spend about half an hour, 40 minutes, playing on their computer to fill up their reports, and the other 20 minutes would be what they're supposed to do. So are you aware of these things? This is what I'm trying to find out. Nobody is. They are doing a great job. They go there for an hour, they are finished. How do we go? We fill up our report for 30, 40 minutes, and if there's any time left and ID is not responsive, well, we can't do anything, here we go. And I'm not saying they're not doing a good job, but they have to follow those stupid rules that you have to file the report, and many of them didn't know how to use the laptop. Neither I, you know, but, uh, so, take more than extra minutes to do the work. So, this is my case, and the other thing, denying Medicaid to Heidi, there was an article in Rutland last month after we had the meeting here, about those red, uh, Syrian refugees that came to Rutland, and one paragraph that hit my eye, and I said, ouch, you know. Uh, possibly absorb, you know, they were wondering how 100 newcomers could come into Rutland, uh, requiring housing, jobs, and English language training, and how they fit into this situation. They failed to mention medical stuff. And I guarantee that many of them could be into Medicaid right now or health insurance. They throw the people that work every time of their life in this state, pay their taxes, and now you have a few dollars more than you're supposed to. So let me throw you under the bus, and what happens after that, we'll deal with that later, but nothing now. So Dick is aware of it, and I was hoping he would be here because I have great respect for him for what he did last year, and I'm sure he can help out with that. At least get an answer. How do you reapply for Medicaid? Nobody knows about that. If you have any answers, I'll be more than happy to hear them. I'd like to share this. I, my, I come from a very large family, and Sandy, I don't know whether you're expecting to take care of one of your parents. Do you? Do you my parents are dead. They're dead. Okay. It, it, I gave two and a half years to my father. I have eight, seven brothers and sisters, 15 nieces and nephews. It took all of us to take care of my father, and that was with a full-time nurse. So I look at Nick's position over here, alone with his wife Heidi, a wonderful woman, screaming, begging for help. Nick Nicolaitis asked you for help last month, and as of this minute, the request that he made you have not returned a phone call. You said you called Dick McCormick and passed it on to him. You didn't call Nick and say, Nick, I, I tried. It's in Dick McCormick's hand. So going rather than going from the nurses up, I think it should come from the leaders or supposed leaders of you, our representative, to pay more attention to citizens like Nick Nicolaitis and many other in the villages that you oversee or you, you're supposed to represent. You sit on, you're, you're an electric grand juror in Rochester. You're on the planning board in Rochester. You just mentioned you're on the Justice Oversight Committee. You're, I believe that, ironically, you chair or co-chair 
the uh, Human Services Committee in Montpelier. Is that true? Yes. Co-chair. Uh, vice chair. You're the vice chair. In that position, do you think, just from a social etiquette and a political etiquette, you co-chair that Human vice. Services Committee and you deny Nick Nicolaitis a phone call? How can you be the co-chair of a committee for human services and you have a constituent that's begging you for help and you ignore them? That's not good. You know, the other thing to and, and, well, well, hold on. I, uh, I talked to my lawyer and he says, well, we'll still have a chance to have an appeal. But he says, your chances for an appeal is zero. Diva is known to retaliate to people that are really pushing the envelope a little bit. And if, oh yes, yes, I know it's news to you, but there are cases that that's what they do. They find ways. Did you ever realize they asked me to prove to them this year that I had a stroke? They needed proof that she had the stroke. I had to go to Gifford to get the report. That thick of what they did to her at the, the emergency room. Who did oversees these for people? Huh? Did you have to pay no. for that report? No, thank God for Gifford. Gifford is a, a great player. Okay. Yeah. Why? Why do I have to prove? And then 2013, two, that, two years before Heidi had the stroke, she sold some stock for I don't know what reason to the amount of 5000 or $8,000. They want me to tell them what did she do with that money. What the hell does she have to do that today? And I have a paper that thick, all the things they ask me to prove. They can't ask you to prove your assets. They can only ask you to prove your income. I believe yes. that is the fact. Yes, for, I, I did anything they point. tell me. But when they, you know, when he kills me, when he killed me, with proof that she had the stroke. What the hell is that freaking person up there that, and that's a little pipsqueak that's in the bottom of the line that who oversees her? I don't know her name, but I send it to yeah, the Yeah, who is Do you know who it is, Sandy? The Diva has a, a, a many, has. many, many uh, uh, eligibility workers. It is required that people reapply, uh, that they have to prove every year that they are um, uh, still eligible. We talked about, I, did, I was talking to someone the other day about that, and we're trying to figure out if there's a way to make the um, the the reapplication more streamlined. Um, one of the problems with Medicaid is that it's um, it's a joint um, state and federal program, and some things are um, federal law and some things are state law. And after I send the report from Gifford that she had the stroke, five days later another letter comes in. We need a letter from her doctor to say that she had a stroke and she was in no need of a nursing home prior to the stroke. I have these things in paper, and I'm not making that up. And I told Dick, if we have time, we can get together. I'll show every freaking paper I sent to the state. And they still pound it. So, and they will doing that, because you dare to go against us, we'll get even with you. Who knows what they're gonna find next year? Or if there is a reapplication for, for Heidi. <coughs> Nobody knows how to do it. Even the state, even my lawyer doesn't know. He says, I'm calling them there and I can't get an answer from them. What do we do after the penalty period that you are hiding off Medicaid? They don't know. But if you ask them up there, oh, we're doing a great job. We try to keep the line on everything. And you're satisfied with that without looking a little deeper, like we did with Brookside, you know, the state. I'm not saying you personally, but the state. That's all I have to say on that, and I hope something comes out of that. I have faith in Dick. He, he can help me a little bit, as he did last year. But this is when I gave up work. I can't work anymore. Not because I don't want to, but I have 20, 30, 30, what? 29 hours a week. Supposedly the nurse and the other two ladies are gonna be hiding. Now, for me to go to work to have a job, my options are so limited, almost zero. Where can I go from nine to one, or 10 to one, or 11 to one, you know? And, and I said, the state, the way they are operating right now, we try to create another problem to show you, you know, 
I can I can go on for a while, but not forever, you know. So this is what you have to look instead of the coyote thing that uh, how to shoot a coyote or what to do with this and that, you know. These are more important functions. Many years ago, there was a commercial. I don't know it was election year. Somebody was pushing an elderly person in a, in a wheelchair, taking it over to the cliff and throw them down. I don't know if it was a Democrat or a Republican, whatever. But this is what you're doing right now. You're trying to create the problem, and then, oh, we should have looked into this, and <coughs> yeah, blah, blah, blah. And that's, I, I, that's I'm finished. Next. Well, I, it just goes back. Why would you not, why would you not return? I don't, this is a major problem. It, it really is, because as I said, taking care of an elderly person is a 24-hour job. My father had a full-time live-in nurse, and it still took the entire family watching the, the prescriptions, the procedures, the nursing home, the mistreatment in the nursing home. If you're not in a nursing home, we were lucky we had a large family because the nursing home was so intimidated because we were always there. We didn't miss a trick. But the tricks they tried to pull were despicable. Absolutely despicable. And, and, and what state was that? That's Pennsylvania. And I'm not trying to take up much time here, but we reached out to newspapers, our state representative, the family did, because of these concerns. And I just, I'm telling you, when you're taking care of an elderly person, God bless them. They need every, every minute of care that you can give. And it's just in total respect for that elderly person. And a person like Nick Nicolais alone with some assistance from the VNA, that's nowhere near enough. I should be down helping Nick and his wife probably four hours a day if I could. And I'm not asking any more than that we had last year, the 39 hours, whatever the amount of hours is, 30, 30 hours, whatever. I'm not asking for any more. I'm happy with that if you can maintain that. But Well, I think it's very sad. Dick, Dick has the name of the little worker I dealt with that has the situational authority. I learned that word from my son when I told him the situation. Who checks on these people? What, what they do on a daily basis? And when they tell me, oh, we didn't get the papers you sent us. How come you didn't get them? What did you do with them? And then this year they're asking the same thing again that I sent last year, the same questions. And I said, what did you do with the things I sent you last year? Nothing has changed. We want them. Break your neck, send her to us so we can throw it in the garbage, and next year we can ask you again the same thing. And this is the situation of the state. The state is broken, the system is, you know. And nobody up there in Montpelier wants to admit that. But we're doing a great job because VNA tells us we're doing a wonderful job. And I told you what, what it is. They are doing a wonderful job, we let them do the job they're supposed to do instead of filing reports for the half an hour. No, oh shoot, I pressed the wrong button, so I had to go over again to start from the beginning. In the meantime, the clock is ticking, time to go. So, that's it. Don't let me talk anymore, shut me off. I work for Stagecoach, and you can imagine that I drive for a lot of the people who don't have insurances. They have Medicaid, and they're elderly. But I've heard the same story over and over again. I know of one incident where the person was denied Medicaid because they had $32 over mm -hmm. the amount. Mm -hmm. How ridiculous. And as this, I agree with him, the state is broke in many instances. You can call and you have to keep redoing and redoing, reapplying, reapplying, and you get nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. And I feel so sorry for these people. I feel blessed because I don't have that problem. But my heart breaks for these people who you can see need help. And they cannot, for the life of them, get it. Uh, they get cut off if there are no show for this, and they're cut off if there are no show for that. And as they say, the rhetoric for trying to get something is almost impossible. Uh, but $32, they got denied? Really? Really? I got, oh, so what do they do? I mean, what is your next step? Are you supposed to sell everything that you've worked 50, 60 years for, 70 years for, so that you can satisfy 
They did. Okay. They did okay. request the sixty-five thousand dollars I took from Heidi's account to pay hospital improvements in the house for her to come home and all that stuff. They don't want to. They don't care about it. You have five thousand dollars more in her account. Your name, and that goes over the limit of the two thousand dollars. That's all they care. Just like the horses with the how they call these things, blinders. Blinders. the blinders. That's what they tell me to do. So that's what I'm doing. Don't bother to look around you to see anything else. And I should say, many of my patients, many of my clients, aren't capable. They don't know how to do this stuff. And they have no means of getting to the proper people or the people coming out. And when he talks about VNA, I took care of a lady just out of the, just wanting to take care of her because I knew her. He's right. They come in. They ask if she's done her walking. No. <laughs> do they do it? No. They get on that laptop and did it, did it, did it, did it. They right. fill that out. They spend 20 or 30 minutes. You know, she never gets walked. She never got checked. And everything is wonderful. But it's not wonderful. I think that people who are in these positions need to go out on the field once in a while, unannounced, and say, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to follow you today. You're a VNA. I'm going to do, I'm going to see what you do today. Yeah. Uh, it's just like uh, people who get uh, stamps, uh, food stamps. Do we ever go to their house? I know I had years ago when I was in my 20s, I made a big stink in the state of New Hampshire. Years ago. <laughs> yeah, about people who have aliases that get food stamps. They have two, three aliases. And people who are getting food stamps and things like that that really, really, don't tell me that you're coming to my house at 2 o'clock on Thursday. You're darn right I'm going to be right and yeah. uppity and doing exactly what I should be doing. Walk in in that house on a Thursday afternoon unannounced and really see what goes on. They're not, they're capable of doing things. Um, I, I do, I think we have, I know that there's, they're understaffed. I know that they don't have that many field and I have a good friend who was in the field for years for, for the state and he said, they are so understaffed to get people out in the field to actually see what's going on is almost impossible. So I don't know. I don't know the answer, but I what? do know that it's. We as health care workers can also write, write on them. There are a few really good ones, but yes, there's yes. a lot who really just suck, just like you said. Excuse well, me. this brings up another point with regards to uh, people on assistance. Uh, maybe you can adjust this, uh, Ms. Nikki. Uh, I'm Nika. Under, uh, Nika. Uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. I understand that people on assistance, I don't know whether it's the EBT system, I don't know what system it is, but they're allowed to buy lottery tickets, alcohol, and cigarettes. Wrong. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that wrong? That's wrong. Mm -hmm. no. But they can. But, but they do. They can transfer and get cash and then yes. go. That's uh, how they do it. Now, I, I have friends that work at Max elders, Market. Elders can get cash, nobody else. Uh, is that a fact? Yes. That's it. Well, that's interesting. I'll be back to if, if anyone, If that's... anyone gives some cash, you call me, we, we call the fraud number because because merchants are not supposed to do that. I have I heard of one merchant in the Northeast Kingdom that may have done that a couple of years ago. It is illegal. Well, so. is it? Can you? I know that the elderly can get cash. The elderly meaning what age and over? Yeah, what is an elder? Sixty-five and older, or well, 60, fifty-five 65, and older? But I don't. Nineteen. Something's not I right there. I say the same thing you do. I also some I seen cash come across. I think some disabled people as well. Are they not eligible for cash return? That's not what I heard. Oh, okay. Well, I, I think uh, maybe you can help us with this, but I think we should know how many people in this county are, are on assistance because I think it's way over the top, and I think there should be there should be some serious. Uh, intervention in people that are getting assistance. Something has to change because the population of assisted people in, just in Rochester is overwhelming. <coughs> and they're all driving new trucks and running up. I, I hear you. Yeah, also, every, every letter I get from the state in regards to Heidi's problems, there's a whole page of languages. If you need help, you can Swahili, Chinese, uh, Cambodian. <laughs> true. If you never heard that. <laughs> Who pays for all these things? We do, but I'll throw Heidi under the bus because she worked here all her life and she made a little extra money. Now we don't need her anymore. She isn't paying any taxes, although she does pay taxes, Social Security. That's a great way of taxation. Wonderful, very wonderful. What else are you going to think to tax after that? 
but I mean, it's been going on for years, not just now. But, and then what I said about those Rutland refugees and the illegals we have working in the farms, they are wonderful people, they are hardworking people. We need them. And as one former uh, representative says, every county or more speaks Spanish, you know. You know that? You know. But they're wonderful. But we'll give them medical attention and probably Medicaid sometime because they don't make enough. But what about us who work here all our lives? You ignoring us, but we pay more attention to them. For what reason? I don't know. Votes, uh, kindness of heart, whatever it is. And I have nothing, I'm an, I'm, a, I'm an immigrant too. I'm a refugee rather, if you didn't know that. My, my father was born in Eastern right. Rumelia, and I urge you to find out what Eastern Rumelia was. It doesn't exist anymore. But in 1950, the United States allowed those refugees from Bulgaria, and now I give it away. Uh, <laughs> so many, about 100 a year, to immigrate to the United States. We got to wait about 10 years to come here. We came here legally, and we came here learning that don't go like this anywhere around. You have to work. You have to go to school at night after you finish work to learn English and get into the system here. Over here now, we have to give them everything. They have no housing, we'll find a house. Who pays for that? We have to uh, give them medical care. Who pays for that? And I'm not saying let them die on the street, but pay attention to us first, to the, le the real citizens that are working here to make this state and this country great. When we finish, I want to say, I'm going to ask you a question when you're ready to go. What did you get out of the whole thing today? Not now, when we finish. A lot of anger. Huh? A lot of anger here. Yes. Do you blame that anger? No. Okay. There's a lot of disappointment too. I, in every category, uh, I just think that we the people have to get active. And I think, you know, just going back to the assistance people, there's more attention to help a kid, an 18 or 21 year old kid in Rochester with assistance than attention for Nick's situation at the top where he really needs the help. We're helping people that should be out working and giving them giving them, them assistance for what? I I can I could show you photographs of these people sitting all day, all summer on the porch, watching the cars go by and they have their own assistance. Now, there there is a fraud unit in the state and I think that if you have a specific complaint about someone well, I think, you should I, I think I, I think going you know through a phone call for one I think universally there's a major problem. I I don't think there's enough policing on how these people first of all, I think after two years of assistance it should they should be identified publicly. They should be in the newspaper. Give them two years for help. And after that point, you, the people in the town are going to know you're, being, you're receiving assistance. Because these people are on these things for life. There are people that knock on doors of businesses every single month asking for a job because they have to prove that they went different. I have a friend. She gets knocked every month. She gets her door knocked on because she has a little tiny business for these assisted people to pretend they're looking for a job. It's about within the same t two days every month they come and knock on the door. She's kind enough to say something, but then they go to their car and write down, I visited blah, 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 so that justifies me getting my assistance card. That's, I think, I think that's probably an unemployment issue. Yeah, that's that's unemployment, that's claiming, claiming. Well, well claiming. it's a combination. The whole, the whole thing yeah. is, is. One of the things that I keep hearing here, and I, I, I'm hearing you know, so, social services, we're lacking in social services. What is the first thing that gets cut in social government? Services. Social services. Yeah. So next time you think about it, when there's an election, think about social services. And who's going to cut it and who's going to put it, who's going to fund it? We can't, we, we can't create jobs without funding. So we can't create people to go help Nick out or to help so-and-so out. We have to fund it. If it's cut, we can't fund it. I was in social services for years. Made nothing, next to nothing in money. I did it because I wanted to. God bless. But you know, there was no money in it. And jobs are getting, I have friends that do it now, and their jobs are getting cut left and right because the funding is disappearing. 
because our government is cutting it because they don't, we can't support these people anymore. So there's got to be a fine line there somehow. There's got to be a fine line. Yes, there are people that are abusing the system, but there are also people that need the system. Right. I we, have to, we have to find it, figure out a way to do it, but we have to fund it. Well, I think policing the assistance across the state of Vermont would fund a lot well, of money. It's, it's, it's the entire country. I know, it's but yeah, it is it just one. one. Yeah, 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 well, well, that's true, but yeah. I, you know, the entire country. You can't. And it's worse in other places. And well, when the case like, worker of Heidi comes up every month, he, he would come. I have to ask this question, Heidi. Do you ever think of suicide? Thank you. And then, you remember the shooting of the social worker up in Barrie? Mm, I yes. know. You're pushing people to do things like that by the stupidity of whoever creates these rules. I have to ask that question to her. She can't answer you. Nick, I have no, why I have no forgiveness for the yeah. shooting in Barrie. None. I, I, no, I'm not saying it was a good thing, Alice. I'm not saying that. But that's how some people are getting pushed against the wall and they blow up. I mean, to me, those two cases, you you have ideas, I mean, uh, thoughts of committing suicide or proof of that you had a stroke, I have to provide you. Yes, I know. In other words, put the knife one more time in there. The first time it wasn't enough. And my wish is the person who is doing this, I hope she suffers the same way Heidi did. 10 times and more. Mr. Moderator, I, I don't want to uh, minimize any of this conversation, but I think the, these two folks have heard, I hope, they've heard loud and clear of the problem. You're right, Dave. I have a couple other questions yeah. I'd like to ask. Take um, the, the first one, Sandy, you talked about what uh, the state might do for oversight with the business of the aging home, you know, the senior homes and whatnot. Right. Have you thought about going to a business, uh, going to one of these homes that's doing well and using those as a resource? I mean, they might know something. I mean, uh, just as an example, we've, at our school, we've been in a deficit at our lunch program ever since I've been involved, anywhere from fifty to $90,000 a year. We've got a new man in there that knows how to do this. We are making a profit, feeding our kids better, feeding more kids, and making money. So what I'm saying is tap into somebody who's doing it right. Not a lobbyist, not somebody that says, I know everything, because those people don't know yep. much. David, are you familiar with Brookside? <clears throat> no, I'm not. Brookside was owned and operated by the Rice family for probably 30 years. Um, Since 1960. Well, 45 years, 50 years. And very, very successfully, they made they made a good living. They didn't make a lot of money, but it was successful. And it had its ups and downs, as every business does. And this company, I don't understand how this happened. Uh, you didn't either. And uh, I, I, this a company came in and bought it and another nursing home, an out-of-state organization. Um, now, when they bought these nursing homes, they had to do due diligence before they bought them. So, I can't understand how they could have gotten access to these two viable properties who provided an excellent service without having done due diligence, and why they didn't have to share that with somebody. Um, I guess but I, free I, enterprise. Think, Brooks, I, I, think, I think Sandy hit the point, though, is the fact that the state is, and we've all said the state is falling down, and that they, they check the, you know, is the floor clean, bought all these things, but they never look at any financials. Well, that's what I, my point is. I, why, why do they? Well, I, I don't I don't know. Know. Did the state has any, any anything in their rules well, that they need to do that? The state supports that nursing home. Uh, the, the state, the, state the, Fed. The, um, the, the, the there are rates that the state sets rates for the Medicaid patients. Um, so there's Medicaid money. Medicare, of course, is 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 entirely federal. Uh, so people who are on rehab, and there are there are a handful of private pay until they use up to thirty-two dollars, and, and then they go on Medicaid. But well, I'm, um, I'm just surprised that there wasn't some further investigation of the financial well, that's it. wherewithal of this company so from New York. It is our understanding from, uh, from the Green Mountain Care Board 
that did do the analysis that, that everybody looked fine on paper. What I've heard subsequently is that the, so I, I talked before about the separation of the real estate ownership and, right. the, and the operation. And whoever was the operator was not confident. But he had Grady You would yeah. think, yes. Yeah. But did the state have to approve the sale? The sale was approved. This, this, right. this problem uh, uh, arose later, and that's that's what we're looking at. Is that that is that there there's review up to the closing, and after the closing, nobody is looking mm -hmm. at the finances. We're going to fix that. Well, these problems started within three months after the sale took took place. Garbage was piling up in the parking lot, mountains of it. The workers were screaming, what are we going to do with that? No, but the state wouldn't listen to that. They come in and probably they will look the other so way, you know. Yeah, I, so I, so I, wrote, I, made a, I made a note of that. It's a great idea. We'll you know? I think another problem we have in the state, and this is statewide, probably uh, uh, all over the country, is, um, and I have no idea how to correct it, we have way too many overpaid lobbyists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't have, Nick doesn't have, uh, Robert doesn't have time to come up there and spend day after day after day in your ear saying, we need this, we need it, we need it now. Where these folks, I don't even know what kind of salaries they make, but it's a heck of a lot more than anyone in here this, in this room makes. And they're in your ear every day. So it, I'll never run for office, but if I were to, the first thing I would say is, if you're a lobbyist, don't come see me. <clears throat> Whatever you want, you're not going to get. Keep them out of the state. I'm sorry. Don't allow there, there are two good ones. But, but I, I will have to say that the only way to get rid of the bad ones is to get rid of them all. So there are citizen lobbyists there every day, lots of them, as well as the paid lobbyists. You know, a lot of volunteers for you know, like the American Heart Association, for example, they have a paid lobbyist. But there are all kinds of groups of citizen lobbyists who come every day. Every day they're there. You come on up and see what's going on. Well, as soon, as soon as I make my millions, so I can yeah. take time off from work. <laughs> I, mean, I take this I day know. off every day. <laughs> <laughs> this morning I take off from work because I think it's important. Yeah. But I guess I haven't found it important enough to take days off. Or when I'm at a should be at a school meeting, I'm not at one of your hearings at six o'clock night. I feel the school, local school, is more important to me. Sure. Than to do one of those sure. hearings. So there's been a couple of hearings I'd like to go to. Um, but anyway, I just hope that we, this group here, is, is now a lobbyist mm -hmm. per se, and you came to us. And that's a good thing. But we don't have the time to do it tomorrow and Wednesday and Thursday, where there are folks who paid to do that. And is there a public me. list of the unpaid paid lobbyists and citizen lobbyists? There is the book still there, in existence. Uh, with the Secretary of State's website has all of the all of the people all who um, are, have to register as lobbyists. And my recollection is you have to register if you spend five hundred dollars in, in a sign -up. So, so any. Um, uh, but but as Alice pointed out, there are we do have we do have citizens who are retired who just come and hang out all the time. There are two things that happen. One, you, you're right. There, are, I, I have to tell you that that at least the the corporate lobbyists um, I I keep at I I am very skeptical when they open their mouths, let's put it that way. But we also have we also have people who are either lobbyists or advocates depending on your point of view for children's needs, for elders' needs, um, and 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 the you know the heart association. They everybody what they do is they have they they amass the um, the data to support their positions and so they are a source of information. It's it, obviously it's all it all has to be checked and counter checked, but but they are actually a check on some of the other folks. Um, but but so with respect to the the so there are firms <laughs> there are firms that have lots and lots and lots of clients. Uh, but they so they would register and they and they have a list of their clients and that is available. Is there a list of, of representatives and senators that take lobbyist money? Um, that, you, you can you, so so um, everybody has to do um, a campaign finance disclosure, okay. um, and so you have to list who gave you money. Okay. Um, and 
and you can say so you can you can re I, I don't I, I think you can do it two ways. I think you can look at let's say a lobbying firm and see who they gave money to during the election cycle, or you can look at an individual um, uh, candidate and okay. see where they got okay. their money. And is that I'm sorry? Is that on the on the House webpage? That's on Secretary of State's webpage. Secretary of State. Yeah. Okay. So if we look at Sandy Hall, yeah. 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 I wanted to ask both of you uh, what your feelings are about term limits. There's a lot of career politicians in the state house. Are you talking about the state house or the federal, or both? I'm, I'm talking about the state of Vermont, career politicians, which I think anyone over two terms, three terms at the most, I think there should be a limit. Because I think we have a big problem with lobbyists and career politicians. It's a little too. We need some refreshing, I think, with uh, positions, whether it be a senator or a state representative. I think it's... There are, there are no term limits in Vermont. I know. I'm asking what your feelings... My feeling is we don't need them because we run every two years. Everybody runs every two years, from the governor right on down. The only people who don't run every two, two years are the state's attorneys and the assistant judges or side judges, so-called. They, they have a longer term, but everybody in the state house is elected from all the statewide offices right on down, with those exceptions, run every two years. So people can go right out and vote them out, or vote them in. Whatever the public chooses is what happens. <coughs> you, uh, there's a, a small flaw there in the fact that history will, will say that even the uh, less than great incumbent has a more than a 50-50 chance to be reelected. Depends on what the issues are. I can remember civil unions. Maybe and maybe many, many people were ousted. So, you know, it, it's what the, you know, you have to agree, you have to say, you know, there are a lot of people who like <coughs> somebody. There are a lot of people who don't like somebody's work. It's, you know, it's a mixed bag. But well, you're right. I, I in agree this town, when I, when I first found the school board, I ran against five people. And there was an open seat. Mm -hmm. Since then, the last 13 years, I've been opposed once. Uh -huh. As long as I'm willing to run, perhaps they think come the perhaps top. they think you're doing a good job. Did you ever think of that? <laughs> and you were complaining before about all the people on the school board who didn't have any experience. That's right. So and, I, and now I don't mean to say that I should have been there for 13 years, and I wouldn't have been someone else to come along. Maybe yeah. not. Maybe they would have voted you in yeah. again. So. Actually, the this, this school board is a really good example. So um, the House has 150 members, and in a typical year, um, in a typical biennium, there are between 30 and 40 new members. So there is constant turnover. Um, and in fact, what I've heard from friends of mine who have worked in, who have visited other state houses uh, in the country uh, that have term limits, the institutional memory is with the lobbyists. So the only people who remember what we did 10 years ago are the lobbyists, and that gives them more power. So there's a real question about we have, I believe that we have a very healthy turnover. You guys have, on this, the Senate has 30 people, and you get five or six. It's so, it's, so we have, we have about it, we have 20 to 30 percent turning over every, every single term. Um, and, and that brings in fresh, fresh blood. I can tell you on my committee we've had um, uh, last last term, we had five freshmen um, out of out of eleven members, and and it was you know on one le on one level we had it took a little while to bring everybody up to speed, but it meant that they were asking all kinds of questions that people didn't usually ask. It's healthy. We have that healthy input of new uh, new energy and new ideas and new questions. It's a constant. Going to economic development, um, Sandy. Like somebody over here wanted to ask a question. Did you? No. So, with regards to economic <laughs> what, development. What you I thought you might have questions look like you were no. going to say something. Uh, over your 13 years of tenure, can you give us some good examples of your efforts in economic development? Yeah, like so, a couple of examples, some businesses that. So, so, so um, um, for most of that time, I have been a member of an informal group that meets um, um, in the morning before, before we go to committee called the Rural Economic Development Working Group. And, um, and in fact, we have this year, we are pushing um, a, um, a fee increase, which is going to cause lots of, lots of, of uh, uh, angst 
amongst some folks uh, to get a little bit more on the universal service fee for a brief period of time to do to, to continue broadband build out. Because one of the things that we know is that um, uh, broadband is it can't be regulated under federal law, which means that we can't we can't make it a public utility like we have phones and electricity. And so the for-profit businesses go where the money is. And the money is not in rural areas. We want, what we want is we want every little town in Vermont to have people be able to work from home, to not have to drive their cars, to be able to send their PDF files to people in New York. And we don't have that yet. And that, that requires some, um, uh, some capital investment in backhaul. And we still don't have that in enough places in the state. So this would create a, a modest, a modest fund to, to continue the build out. So at the um, meet the meet the uh, the candidate uh, last year at the library, I think you attended. Meet the I candidates. Did. I sat with you and asked a question about economic development, and you answered me saying you personally, quote unquote, do not want some outside company coming into Rochester. You want the company homegrown, like some organic new peanut that could be grown, but you don't want a company coming in from the outside to create jobs in the valley. That was what you said to me. I have it written down. So you, you actually said you, you don't want an outside company coming into like the plywood plant with, uh, let's say it's from uh, New Hampshire. You, you want it homegrown, like out of the house. So it brings up another question with regards to bed and breakfasts. Are you still in the bed and breakfast business? No, we've retired. You retired. Okay. It's still on your bio um, on the legislative website that you know you run a bed and breakfast. Now I understand there's some legislation coming through where they want to register all people that are doing Airbnb in the state of Vermont. Is that something on your on your uh, agenda? In other words, if I want to rent part of my home, which is like yeah. a little small business, now the state wants anybody doing that to be registered with the state. So here's, here's the situation going on. Are you aware of that? Okay. Let me talk to you about the situation going on with Airbnbs. And that's not a bill in my committee, but let me talk to you about that. The situation with Airbnbs is we have many, many bed and breakfasts, inns, motels, right. complaining about, say, there's a large house. I can think of a guy right in Bridgewater who he has a bed and breakfast license, all the fire inspections done, water testing, all that stuff yeah. done. And next to him is a large old house. That person um, does Airbnb, and outside their home on a big weekend would be 15 or 20 cars with equal number of people or more. And of course, there's nobody checking that for fire, there's nobody checking that for water. And so the people who are paying all the bills and doing these things, the fellow in Bridgewater has a commercial, his, his taxes are marked down as commercial. So, so he, um, he's come to me. And as have many other people doing yeah. Airbnb, uh, doing legitimate hotels. And it's not that he's against Airbnb. He just wants them to be approved the same way he has to go through. The other thing is Airbnb never collected the taxes, the room and occupancy tax. However, we worked with Airbnb, and now they collect the Airbnb tax right through them and right. pay it to the state of Vermont. So right. that is happening, which is very good. Still, there are the issues, and there was a study group, I think, to look into that. I haven't checked on it lately. That was looking at the issue of safety. In other words, you know, overcrowded homes, no fire escape, people not knowing how to run a, you know, a wood stove, putting the ashes on the deck. You know, just all of that going on. And there are, there is a need. We don't, we don't want an incident in Vermont where, you know, there's a fire and people are killed in an Airbnb that isn't safe. So that's being looked into. It, there isn't uh, and something done, but there was with regard to the tax. And the tax department, as I say, worked with Airbnb, and now the tax is collected, which is good for the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's over uh, 18 million last year. For Airbnb taxes? The, the state collected between 18 and 22 million from Airbnb receipts. Really? Wow. Great. Yeah, no, I, I, was, I was a hotel manager also in my career. Oh, yes. yeah. That's great what you said. Is they need yeah, to be regulated. Is. Oh, uh, really? well, agree they need to be. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you go through play, you see these safety issues. Yeah. I've been in Airbnbs so with like, how do we get out of here? Yeah. If there's a fire, how do I get out? Yeah. So that's being looked No into. smoke detectors, nothing. I mean, it's just, yeah. 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 So it's very important for safety. It's not the registered, licensed 
hotels and inns have to do it, the Airbnb should have to do it as well. Well, it's like the dynamics of Uber, you know. Uh, there's, a, there's a great book that you might want to read. It's called Who Moved the Cheese? It's a, it's a business book. So all of a sudden, there's a dynamic where Uber comes in and upsets an entire marketplace, just like Airbnb did. It, it's a great book, by the way. And it, 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 all of a sudden, the game can change. Unfortunately, sometimes state laws and everything else aren't up to the game changer. It happens in huge corporations. Someone inv inv invents a new mouse trap, and all of a sudden the market changes, and they're swept away with nothing. You know. So last so, year, speak, you're speaking about Uber. I don't we cut you off, but yeah. people might want to know. So last year, um, with regard to Uber and the taxi companies, this is Uber is basically only operating out of Burlington. Right. Maybe they'll go someplace else in the state, and maybe there's, occasionally there's someplace else. But basically, they're operating in Burlington, and there's a, and Lyft. L it's LIFT. Yeah. Yeah. It's also uh, somewhat operating in Burlington, as I understand it. So we had it in our judiciary committee. The taxi people, of course, said, "Hey, I have to register. I have to pay all these fees. Right. I have to, you know, do this and that." And so that was taken up, and we actually passed a bill last year with regard to, um, and and apparently Uber in Burlington, I think, is doing this record check for sex offenders driving Uber cars. You know, there's a real opportunity to be a predator on some innocent victim that gets in your car. So that, we set up a program whereby they need, but they were already, Burlington said, we're going to do it anyway because they have a license for Uber there to check for, they have to go check the sex offender registry. So, you know, there are things that come right. about, um, you know, by yeah. people talking about it, complaining, and so, to make it a little more equitable for taxi companies. The other thing, there was a very big dis uh, look at insurance for Uber drivers. Now, Uber insures them when they have a passenger in the car. In other words, Uber pays the car insurance when the Uber person has a person in their personal car. But the fact is, their own insurance, in other words, they're riding around looking for someone to right. pick up. When they're on the call from Uber says, okay, you're, you're on my, you're on now, so you pick up somebody you know, to see them or whatever. The part whereby their own personal insurance doesn't cover it is when they get the call, Uber gets the call, the driver gets the call. His own insurance cuts out when he starts working for Uber. And I've seen that in a couple of policies, we've looked at it. So we, we tried to get them to cover that, Uber to cover that portion. Once the car driver gets a ding, but before he gets the person in his car, um, there was no insurance coverage. So if he runs into you, if he uh, runs down a kid on the street, you know, it wasn't being covered. So that part's, I think that's still in the works. I don't know where that is right now, but his own insurance will cut him off when he goes to work for Uber. Wow. And because the Uber insurance will pick him up, but again, that period of time before the person gets in the car, um, hmm. they weren't covered. So no Uber driver wants that either. Yes. Yeah, I have a question about they were talking about uh, changing the, the way education is funded, and also that to do the income sensitivity, they may do away with that too. Uh, how's that going to affect me? Probably yes, unless you're under forty-seven thousand. I mean, this is a bill that has not passed. It's been being worked on in the House over and over and over again. Um, is it? Do I know enough about it to say it is or isn't a good bill from what I've read? I don't think I like the sound of it, but I've got to really look at it. So that um, they had, I, I, I can say that yes, I really don't like it, what I know about it. Um, they had said they were going to try to vote it out on Friday, and they didn't. Uh, as I said, this Friday is, 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 uh, is crossover. Um, I don't think that I don't think it's going to move this year. And if and if it if it did get out of the house, then it ha would have to would have to go get over the Senate hurdle. Um, so th there's been push there's been a push for a long time to try to get to something that is even more income income based than what we have. And and, and as a matter of policy, I agree with that. The problem with any tax bill is that the devil is always in the details, and the details in what I've seen of this are not good, and in fact, um, look like they would actually drive up the property taxes, because that would be the only, that would be the yeah. only um, 
uh, expansion valve. So if any, you know, everything else is set, and if anything, and if you need more money, then it has to come out of property taxes. Why so, property taxes only all the time? Why does everybody pay for it? That's My taxes went four hundred dollars a year more last year, higher than the year before. A little over four thousand dollars. We are on a fixed income, if you want to say so. Next year, the way I see it, it's going to go maybe another five hundred dollars. Where is that going to stop for the property owners? How far can they live? And you said it before that the aging population is getting bigger and bigger, and many of us are having our own properties. That's why to people, keep it. You're right, Nick. That's why people are screaming to get away from the property tax and go more to income. Yeah. And that's this bill would do that. It would still have the um, the business and second homeowners and people in Vermont who own camp. They would pay at the fixed rate that they do now. But all the other money needed would have to come out of income or property taxes. I mean, it's, it's it, they haven't, you know, they had we have um, the Joint Fiscal Office, which runs all kinds of numbers on, on computers to figure out who will be <coughs> impacted, you know, and obviously it will change from year to year depending upon what budgets were voted in. But um, they, they run all those numbers and they haven't gotten accurate numbers or enough information yet. And no. they haven't. It isn't, it isn't sorted out, so as you say, you're wondering what will happen. Um, we don't know yet, but that bill has not passed. The school consolidation was supposed to help me on the taxes. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's some, some towns, supposedly, <laughs> it is. In some towns, it is. Yeah. From South Th Rosa. This year. This year. Yeah. And next year. And, and just to put two things together that we've down. talked about, I people who are running enough. Uber out of their houses are still, they still own a residence. They're still getting all the benefits. The Airbnb people are getting all the benefits that, that private residences get and because they're not registering as, they're not businesses yet, they're not corporations. And that's going to all have to change that's right. as this goes through. Well, what's happening in uh, what I see in just the real estate market? Um, can we, what, can we go back to the school thing? Or well, no, I, yeah. I wanted to yeah. go back to, to very quickly. But the school merger is causing, uh, is, is a big false in some towns it saved money and others who know okay, what's going on. But this is what's happening. The cost of school is driving the property taxes so high that the local Vermonter, yes, I, we I know that. Yes, we know that. What's happening is we, they can't afford their homes. They're, moved, they're leaving the state and people from right. the flatlands are buying the property and turning the property into Airbnb. It's all that's, on that's true, But in terms so, of the, um, you know, there, we do have income sensitivity at this point, which is, as you said, what's going to have an effect goes away. So that, that is certainly a big worry. But there is income sensitivity for people right now. For, prim for primary residents. For residence. primary residents, not for commercial or second homes. 74% of my taxes goes to education. It goes to education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, big deal. Um, yeah, it's a lot deal. of money being spent on education. But, and, yeah, yeah, they, now, I don't... You're on the board, uh, so you know more uh, about this. Obviously, I, I heard a different version of, of what this law is going to be, or what they're yeah. trying to do. <coughs> they, they went from a, a, to a yield rather than a, a dollar, fixed dollar amount. But as I understood it, it was going to go to about somewhere near, or around 50% of what they need for education was going to come from property tax. The other 50% was going to come from an income tax. Except and the income tax is not going to take effect until you made more than 47000 And then it would be tiered. Except, except that's, except, that's the down and dirty that I've heard. Except that, um, the, yes, the, yes, the 50%, except that that can expand to meet local budgets. So if the so if the if the local budget goes up, understood. But that's still if you go to 50%, and even that expansion, unless it gets really way up, it's still going to be, be a relief to property tax owners. It may not be if you are still making two hundred thousand dollars a year, you will not see any relief. But for those who are making less than forty-seven dollars, forty-seven thousand, that's per that, household. Per household, that that number, <coughs> you will pay that. Whatever that number is, 48 cents, or whatever they have talked about. And that, that'll be your property tax, and that'll be your education tax. If you get over 47,000, then it'll tear up. And then at some point, you'll be back where you were. That's how it was explained to me. So, well, you I, I haven't, I haven't, uh, Bill is in the house, and so I haven't looked at it. And I don't want to look at it until I know what's I happening. Have a, I have a people at the VSBA that watch it very closely. Yeah, and I live with a woman. 
woman, I, my, one of my housemates is on the education committee. So, well, I can so she's not sure she wants it either. I, I think it, I think we all have problems, but I don't, I don't know what's working. What we have isn't working. Well, in your uh, in your supervisory union where you live, Ludlow. You're in Ludlow, right? So is that part of the Woodstock Reading? It is no. not. Okay. It but is not, and what's going on in my town, we had three votes about a merger. The first one failed, it would have sent the, we're already part of a small union. Mount Holly, which is near, which is in Rutland County and nearer to Rutland, where this, in Clarendon, there's a school, Mill River, which the people in Mount Holly, Wacker, my town, we have a diminished number of students, of course. It's a wonderful, it's been a wonderful school. President Coolidge went there, and we love that school. But we don't have the students in our town. Well, they simply weren't born well, excuse all over me, the country. But, okay, the supervisory union, though, that's Woodstock, Killington, and all that. I no. counted the amount of people that work at the supervisory union and compared it to the, this White River supervisory union down the road. Mm -hmm. They, I forget the name of it, the acronym for that school district, but they have six employees. And six employees. Woodstock? The supervisory union. Windsor, supervisory North. Windsor North, is it? I can't remember. Well, what's what's what the administration? You think they only have six employees? The, the supervisory union, from their website, they've got six employees. That's listed on the site. I'll probably go down there and look in the office. I'm okay. In, in, our supervisory union has 20, I think 24. You know, a lot of the special ed people have been moved into the purview of the supervisory union. So Woodstock, that union, I don't know that more than six people. Not only that, but I, I, and not to get off. Well, they didn't list them on the website. I don't but, know. Uh, I got an idea that they have, and I would bet money on the fact of who they call an employee and who you're calling an employee. And I think the numbers would, would they're not that far apart. But also, <laughs> don't forget Woodstock, that, that union has three counts? It has. No, it's more than it's three. It's Bridgewater. more than three towns. Yeah, it's like five. Well, they've, they've had Bridgewater consolidated with um, Pomford. Now they're, those Bridgewater children go over to Pomford. Right. And so they're part of that district there. Okay. We've just we just uh, <clears throat> consolidated. Now we have 10 towns. You have 10 towns. Okay. And they're scattered. Then from one end to the other is 56 months. Yeah. So, um, and I'm in the office at least once a week. And there's nobody in there twirling their thumbs. In the supervisory. In supervisory. Well, that, that's the reason I brought it up because the gentleman brought up 74% of his property taxes go to education. The last meeting we had here, you were going to get back, we were going to talk about what percentage goes to, the, to support the supervisory. Yeah. I thought it was 40% of your 74% goes way to the top to pay for the supervisory. It never gets to the child. Absolutely not. I actually brought it. I don't know if we have time to go over it, but I, I can't. So it's not 40%. Like it's not, but the big number is you, I think everybody gets to look at, is how much money goes to the SU office. Right. In the SU office, there is special ed, right. and there's office expense. Okay. I think we have, and I'm just going to. Off the top of my head, there's about $3.2 million in our SU that goes down to that office. Sounds about right. About 800000 of that is actually the office expense. The rest of it, 2.1 or something like that, is special ed. Which, not, now don't, don't forget, out of that 2.1, we get reimbursed about 46%, 44, 46, somewhere in there. And then when, when you have a child that is over what they call extreme, need or whatever, yeah. then it goes up as high as 90%. When you get over 55,000 per child or something like that, goes, yeah, you yeah. probably know more about that than I do. But well, so, like so when you look at that 2.1 million yeah. expense, you've got to, to get a real handle on it. You've got to go over to this side and look at the revenue and see what, how much revenue we're receiving for our special ed to see what it's actually costing us in dollars and your tax rate. It's very complicated. Uh, I was, that's why I say about these new people, I was in the, I was on school board three years. I was going to make, I was going to change everything. Three years later, I'm just starting to get a grasp on how school finance works. Yeah. Well, I know they pay $54,000 a year for their, for their real estate where they rent. Um, and of course, someone mentioned salaries over here. Donna was kind enough, I mentioned this last time. I requested salaries for everyone that works at the supervisory union. 
in the White River. And she very kindly sent it to me. But some of the numbers are kind of high. They really are. I don't have my computer. I'd like I to was, show that to you. Also, uh, the, the average salary we pay average or less than the rest of the state. Definitely way less than the rest of the country. I can, bring, I can get your documentation on that. I know we haven't, but uh, I apologize to Neil that I didn't have a chance to get these numbers so I could have them for today, but hopefully things are coming down. We, we, we think we've settled one of our contracts, so now I don't have to meet three nights a week. There's a lot, there's a lot more to it than the, just the, the quick numbers you read. I, that, I think that's what I'm, what I'm trying to say. The quick numbers that come in these books don't look good. You, but you have to be able to look at the expenditures yeah. and where, and then look at the revenue page. Well, I think, uh, I don't know your name, but Ted? Like Ted, Ted knows that 74% of his property taxes go to the school. I think it would be a great exercise for us to find out exactly what that is for the next meeting. What percentage of 74% goes, to, without any complications, the, the number has to be finite, I mean, yep. right? So we were talking you know about I mean? we like, talked about what percentage of the school budget was compensation, and we we have, this year we've gone from you make fifty thousand dollars a year down to what is your compensation? Compensation is salary, right? Health benefits, dental benefits, vision benefits, uh, personal days, shoes, all, all, all anything. <laughs> well, well, that is what we have done this year. Is well, I can give you. I can give you a number. It's going to scare you what the percentage is now that we have gone to total compensation. Because I don't think anybody realized the person who was making $70,000 was costing the school district well over 100. That's right. Yeah. Well over 100. That's right. well, it's a number. But it doesn't add show on a tenant for you. It, it does if you know where to add it. Yeah. Right. Well, that's the whole, thing. I, I think it was like $52 a day per student. This cost. Is this kid getting $52 worth of knowledge per day? I don't think so. Unfortunately, we don't, and I don't mean to take everybody's time, but no, unfortunately, a lot of kids get what they're willing to take in. They may be getting $52 pushed at them, mm -hmm. but how much are they letting in? And, and is that number, does that take into account their share of like the heat, the mortgage, the insurance? Is that what's being put into that calculation, 52 a day? Well, I went with, a, with the, the cost per student, but at the number of days that they go to school. Days. But I mean, do they include those numbers in the cost per student? I'm not sure it goes in the number for a couple of them. Uh, yes, uh, as a Rochester resident, you just mentioned this issue about how much a child allows in. And a lot of that is a reflection of their community and the state of the world around them and how we're all interacting. We had a very important moment in our town where we had a change of government to a new merger. Unfortunately, you two were not there with the education uh, uh, secretary. In fact, basically nobody was there. Were we invited even? Oh, uh, I'm talking about a, a situation where we're changing governments. Yeah. This is your job. I, we have is this been. where the drum rolls go? Yes, we have been no, at no, many school saying. meetings. No, no, no. I'm not talking about school meeting. I'm talking about a, a historical moment yeah. for our community to change our way of governance mm -hmm. to a merger situation. Yes. The, second, uh, the Secretary of Education was there. Nobody else. Basically, maybe five residents out of 500 yes votes. Something is missing here. A connection of how we relate to education. And when these students aren't absorbing the information, they're picking up something. I just want to put this out. That we have a duty, all of us, when we have a change of government, we need to be there. And I was shocked that we had no representatives there. And, you know, I just wanted to leave it at that. Well, that was kind of you, Mason, to record it because I watched in total disgust. Um, that the, they they approved uh, eight thousand dollars stipend budget. There's there's uh, Rebecca Holcomb and 
Martha Slater, and like five other people in the NP Auditorium and the new merging school board. One of the most emotional educational decisions. It went all last summer. I was almost at every single meeting. Sandy, you used to go to the meetings early last summer. You hadn't been at a school board meeting since, I don't know when, back in July was the last one I saw that. And then we have this, like Mason said, a very important merger, a marriage of these two school districts, the mixing of the boards. There's no representative there. But it's like, why? How can that be? Not only is no representative, there also aren't the, the members of the community okay. there. Either. Oh, absolutely it's not. A five million dollar budget and probably fifty people, fifty residents of there. Yeah, voting that's true. I would, I would. We go for band concert. We can vote one hundred and fifty dollars for this, and yeah. it's a yes or no. But when it comes to really something important, they all you know, run into the bushes. Now I'm curious to see what's going to happen next Monday yeah. night. Yeah, and because then it's going to be Royalton. Royalton will have their annual meeting. Yeah. But next Tuesday at night will be the newest yeah. White River Valley Union District meeting. It will be held in Bethel, in Bethel. for yeah. Royalton and Bethel residents. I think there's approximately, uh, I want to say, somewhere around 3,000 voters. Yeah. I will be surprised if there's 210 people. You're probably there. setting it high. Oh, you're, oh, you're way high. high. You're we're gonna, and we're going to be voting on the $11.6 million budget. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But when we tried to change the <coughs> school, we didn't have a room big enough <coughs> in, our, <coughs> in our school. Yeah. And when we do have, the, have these meetings all this last month, that has been more of a discussion about the colors of the school, yeah. the name of the mascot, or the name of the school, then what are we going to do about education? <laughs> what kind of right. program here are we going to have? But the sad part is, like when it's on, you, get, you can't do a line item. Well, I don't like this part. You can't pick the budget apart. You, and people say, after a while, what's the sense of going you know, beating it against the wall? Well, the dumbing down is there. I mean, people are just, they gave up. They, they yeah. lost all their emotions during this uh, this merger situation. Yeah. It was so bad that people just said, you know what, I can't deal with this anymore. No. And I, I attended the meetings. I mean, I mentioned the one in Stockbridge last August 8th when the supervisory union, backed by a consultant, Mr. Dale. Lab, Mr. Dale. <laughs> and we sat there for almost two and a half hours before uh, the eureka of all Mr. Dale and Labs's numbers were totally wrong. It shut down the whole meeting. Not only that, kids had been, kids were trying to make decisions. Parents were trying to make decisions on where to send their children, and it delayed the decision because of the missed numbers for almost another three weeks a month, forcing parents to just throw their arms up. So it got to the yeah, point where they just said, you know, I don't even care, yeah. and they're done. So why go to the meeting? Yeah, work a little hard and pay your taxes and just shut up. Yeah, it's just like. Education, the, the importance of education, it's the, it's the driver of economies. It's if you don't have a good education system in your town, you may as well close the town. People aren't going to move here with young children. I mean, look at who's going to send their child to Rochester? Kids aren't going to move to this town and the well, education department, but it, uh, because the adults can't find a good paying job. That's, oh, well, that's the other point. It, it, will, it feeds itself I got because it. there's no economic <laughs> development happening. The school system's a disaster. I mean, the children in Rochester take phys ed on a computer. <laughs> and it's a software driven. <laughs> they, they do phys ed on a computer. That's all they want to watch. Now, someone, at the, <laughs> someone at the state house approved statewide <clears throat> to, re, to riff the phys ed teacher and replace it with software where excuse, the kids excuse me the state is that no one in the state house votes on local school budgets okay, that was right. a local decision by locally elected people okay all i'm saying is i think it's despicable like a child a six or eight or ten year old child sits and takes phys ed on a laptop well you'd be surprised where the software is yeah. But so, just a, just an interesting piece on history of schools in Vermont, which in the archives of the State House, there's all kinds of material about the and in towns about the fights about closing small schools that happened at the turn of the century. And I don't mean this last turn. 
I mean back from the 1800s mm -hmm. to the 1900s, yeah. you know, we have all many, many small schools and districts that were then the districts around the state, and now we know that there was equal pain and terrible when they voted to close a lot of those small schools, and now people are living in those places. But it, this has not been a new problem in terms yeah. of, you know, populations changing, uh, things happening, and so there we were, you know, the, the more than 100 years ago. Yeah, no, it that, doesn't, yeah. yeah. The history of Royalton and Hope uh -huh. Nash wrote the history, and it had a little picture of the, the school up on Dairy Hill when they consolidated went down. And there's a little bleep on the bottom. They did it to save Texas. We know on the bottom that Texas is still in Greece. Ah. <laughs> so it didn't work then. So it I don't know if it's going to work today. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Here, it didn't yeah. work then. One more quick thing. Last week, you had a hearing about guns up in Montpelier. We did. Right? I think you were in the committee that... I was. Right. Mm -hmm. And in the news, that's where I saw it. So several people attended. How many people were there that night? Roughly, if you remember. More than a thousand. They were a thousand people. Yeah. Fine. And that's what they tell me. More? I didn't count them. Are you going to have any more hearings? Uh, another hearing like that? Any more hearings? Not one. What I'm trying to we've say been is, we've been having a hearing in our committee all week mm -hmm. and in part of last week with regard to the issues that were raised at that hearing and yeah. that are relate to the three bills that are in the Senate. What I'm questioning is, yeah. are you going to base your findings on that hearing that happened last week with a thousand <coughs> people? Yes, there were a lot of people, now I remember. Yeah. What about having the hearing here in Vermont? In, in the center of Vermont, <laughs> yes. we have a yeah, lot of small absolutely. towns around us. But I see every time there's a hearing to that magnitude, we have yeah. Montpelier or Burlington or Brownboro or Springfield. Well, there is more of Vermont, you know. I, I agree, Nick. So the week before that, we had, or actually, was it last Monday, perhaps? I can't remember. Last Monday night, we had a hearing. I'm on the Budget Committee, the Appropriations Committee, and we held hearings as many of us could go, all over the state. We had them in Springfield, we had them in Hyde Park, or Burlington, Rockland, hearings on the budget so that we know that people can't all come to Montpelier. Mm -hmm. So we've had have different hearings all around the state, as many as we can, so that people can come and be heard, because you're right, well, you got to get to Montpelier. Mm -hmm. So we try to do that. So I'm trying to think about, we had a hearing on this one last year, on the gun issue, I don't know. Well, but I said I have nothing against. We had a hearing last you know, year. But don't base your results or your. Uh, right, we're hearing from people all the time. You know, people have yeah. email. People send us emails. True. People call. People send letters. If you want. People call at home all the time. So we're hearing from people. Yeah, yeah. I'm not all defending over. either side. No, no, no. Guns, you we're know, hearing from all of them. Right. Uh, about gun control. Yes. Your well, as I mentioned earlier, on Friday our committee passed out this bill with regard to guns, fire, you know, firearms of all kinds, um, explosives, dangerous weapons in other words, that we passed that bill out on Friday. We've been working on it, we've been working with all groups. You know, it's not like Washington where one side just goes and does everything. We've had the gun owners in, we've got the people who are concerned about you know, not having a background check, people who are concerned about dangerous people, just like the Fairhaven guy. And so we've been working on this bill for quite a while. It was introduced last fall when we weren't even there. Because we have a Every new bill had to be in by December 13th. The House has a later date, but for our Senate bills, that's when they have to be in. So this bill was put in with regard to extreme risk before the most recent situations happened. So that, you know, you can go in and take a gun when there's an extreme risk. Not you, I mean the police can take a gun when there's an extreme risk found in by adults. In other words, there's a due process. You can't just go in and grab a gun. Except, as I said, domestic violence situation where there's an immediate need, the police can absolutely take the gun. And of course, they will do. So assault weapons have they entered into that? They're not. You know, no. I mean, if the person has an assault weapon, yes, that can be taken. Yes. The no, I mean, and they don't. Are they going to limit what you can buy for guns? That's not a bill that was introduced, but it, you know, if you keep hearing that they're working on it, they may work on it. Yeah. Kind of, it it's unknown at this point. Yeah. What is the law regarding Vermonters and guns? You can take get guns. You can have guns, absolutely. Okay. 
So whenever anybody goes to buy a gun, they have to, they're buying it from a dealer, you know, a sports shop, Dick's Sporting Goods, Walmart. I don't know if Walmart still sells them, but Dick's Sporting Goods in Rowland. And so in order to purchase a firearm, the purchasee has to go through the federal background check. That's from the Jim Brady situation that came about. He was the um, press secretary for President Reagan when President Reagan was shot. Um, Jim Brady was shot also, and a bill was passed by Congress that covers the whole country. So whenever you buy a gun at a, at a shop, you have to go through that check. It's very quick. You fill out this form, has a lot of information on it. They send it into the FBI NICS system, and then it comes back that you can or can't purchase. What's the turnaround on that? The turnaround on that is very, very quick. Yeah. Very quick. Yeah. Yes. Personal sales, gun shows. Gun shows, let me speak about those. So everybody keeps saying the gun show loophole. So in Vermont, when, you, when there's a gun show held, um, every licensed dealer in there, and that's all who's licensed in there, the people with the booth, you know, they pay money to have a booth and start a show. And they they ought to put people through record checks. They cannot sell without putting people through record checks. So now there's the situation of private individuals who can sell at a gun show. So as I understand it, and I've talked to a lot of people, I haven't done a gun show myself, but if you're a private individual and you want to sell your rifle, you go into the show, you put a flag and a little flag sticks out of the barrel, and then someone else who's wandering around can see it and say, hey, I'd be interested in that gun. You set a price maybe, and then you pull. This is voluntary on the part of the gun show promoters. They, they make you go to, and this is not the law, but they make you go to a booth that is a federal firearms dealer, and that person runs the record check, and then the transfer of the gun can occur. Now, this doesn't stop somebody who wants to do something out in the parking lot outside the purview of the gun show. If that's a private to private sale. So that's a bill that um, we have also. And we, we feel that this bill that we're doing will take care of almost all the really difficult situations. The problem with S6, which is the, um, the uh, record check on private to private sales, there's a criminal penalty if you do that. And that would mean, and there are some exceptions for very close relatives. But if an uncle wanted to sell a, a gun to his nephew, and he did that, if this has six passed, and that's not the bill I've been talking about, then that person would be subject to a criminal act and could go to jail for a year. You mean no. the one that's selling the gun? The private to private. Yeah. 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 If it goes, you can commercial. No, no, no. no. This is just the sale itself. This is only the sale. This is only to do with the sale. And there was another piece with regard to domestic violence, which we, we think we've covered that by our bill that we've got 221, which is coming out on the floor this week. We believe we've covered that situation. A dangerous, yeah, an extreme risk, and you know, a dangerous situation. Thank you. So hopefully, um, you know, it will pass. I think it's a very good bill. Um, I, and I think I would really like to say that. Um, you know, the gun groups and the domestic violence groups, we all worked, they all worked together. They were all in our community, they all were testifying. Um, you know, it was a very um, civil way it was done. And I think, you know, you're not going to see this in Washington, but we did this a way that it can be done in Vermont. Do you so, think the teachers should have guns in school? Um, I think in general they shouldn't, but it may well be that it would be a good idea for one teacher or two teachers who are qualified and have taken all the training and who would want to do it to maybe have one. I mean, I know certainly arming every teacher is not the answer, but, you know, maybe having some more security at school because in terms of hearing about these people who have um, said they're going to do a shoot school shooting, I mean, the... the um, they want to play Russian roulette. The fellow in, the fellow in um, Fair Haven, as I understand it, his, his goal was to, this is terrible, shoot the school resource officer who was the policeman first and then kill the people. So, you know, so obviously there's, you know, there's, there's a person there. And well, it might stop them. them too if they knew that there were guns in school. I'm sorry? I mean, it might stop some of that. If they know that yeah. school, there was a man on television and they said, I think there's eight in their school. I don't know how many of them, but eight of them carry, have weapons in the school. It's, it's a terribly tragic situation. It's terrible. It is. It's, uh, Absolutely. I, I'm kind of jumping in here late yeah. on this, cause, but you know we've got these AR-15s that yes. can be modified. Yeah. Okay. Do you think somebody with a pistol has half a chance against somebody with one of those guns? Yeah, it's true. Do you have?
Yeah. 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 And the second thing I'd like to well, just Well, certainly can't stand there. Yeah, you, you, you could. You could. Contest. Well, I guess sort of the second thing I'd like to just meant, say is you can walk into a Walmart and you can buy one of these guns. Yeah, with a red matcher. Why can't I walk into Walmart and buy a rocket launcher? Well, I mean, that's just it. it this is this it weapon was designed. Yeah, well, the weapon was designed for military use, and it was banned for years. Only the military could have them. Then somewhere along the line, they let it go. You could go ahead. Anybody can own one of these. So we have we have people owning military-style weapons that are just average citizens. Why can't we? Well, we, well it's, a, it's you know it's, it's an extreme, but it's a metaphor. Why can't I go buy a rocket launcher? Why can't I buy hand grenades? Mm -hmm. Hand yeah. grenades would come this world. <laughs> I'll just say, I, you know, it's, just, it's, it's, it's amazing to think that I can go in and buy, yeah. and for a few dollars more, buy this this modification thing. Mm -hmm. Well, an explosive and, drone. Yeah, explosive yeah, so, drone. What's yeah, the difference? Yeah, well, you know, the same thing. You could yeah. go in. Yeah, why, it's, it's, I mean, if you're, buy, you're able to buy a military right. piece of equipment. Why right. can't I buy a tank? I'm going to go in and shoot up a speed. I'm not going to walk in. You probably can buy it. You probably can, yeah. You're going to buy a working one. Yeah. If this mentally ill person wants to, you know, the, is determined. Well, yeah. is determined to shoot a bunch of people up. Why would they not choose the AR kit, whatever the hell it is? I mean, they're yeah, going with a little tiny gun. Yeah, exactly. So, That's what they're going in with. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, and you have no a chance. Right. right. Yeah. Somebody's, yeah. You don't have a chance. But at least they, yeah. I know I have a 1% chance to defend myself. If you're lucky. Yeah. 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 No, I agree with you. I'm not disagreeing with you. guy on TV in Colorado, he has to reach into his boot yeah, right. to get his pistol. And then he has yeah. to get his magazine. Yeah. Well, I think I, I would be for, you know, banning this. Banning, yeah. banning yeah. those. Yeah. I'm a, gun, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I don't, I've never shot, I shot a gun a bullet once in my life. I'm not a gun guy, but I think we should be able to have guns. But the AR, whatever that thing is called, yeah. I agree that there should be federal. All the rifles in the world, all the pistols in the world, you can own them all. Yeah. Own them all. Because you can only shoot one or two bullets right. at a time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's safe. No, it's safe. We, could, we could be here right now and somebody across the street could put one of those things out of the car. Right. In a matter of seconds. That's true. Yeah. And so, the gun came from out of state. We're, 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 we're wherever, yeah. where the gun yeah. came from. Right. The gun has Let me just mention away. another I thing agree. with regard to people purchasing guns on the dark web. Yeah. That's another issue. It's already illegal for someone to ship a gun to a private person uh -huh. in a state. In other words, somebody in New Hampshire wants to ship a gun over here. That's illegal without going through a gun dealer here. In other words, if a gun if a gun shop in Vermont <coughs> selling guns and someone comes in from out of state, uh -huh. the person can purchase a long gun. Yeah. But if they want a pistol, uh -huh. the pistol, they would purchase it at the store, but they would not be given it. It has to be shipped to a licensed dealer in another state, right. which runs the person through the record check, before it can be turned over to the resident of that state. Okay. Because I just got a letter from someone saying everybody's getting their guns in Vermont taken to Massachusetts. We, we had that looked into, and it's yeah, not yeah. the case. Yes, somebody might come here, get a pistol, but as I say, it has to go through a licensed dealer in the house yeah. before yeah. it can be given to the person. Yeah. Yeah. I buy an AR-15 by in pieces online. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can buy, or make one with, put it together. you can make one with, with a 3D, 3D printer. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, there was the guys in yeah. Burlington that bought one in a parking lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I just do. I, I, know, I, I, I know there's there's a lot of money behind these the, the gun control thing. But I know there's a ton. That's why one of the questions I ask about well, can you see who's getting money from that? You know, from lobbyists. You can. We've got a very powerful organization out there right now that's really it's I don't it maybe protecting our rights, our Second Amendment rights. And I always say this: the Second Amendment was written when you had muzzle loaders. Mm -hmm. It took three minutes to reload <laughs> before you could shoot another person. So, so the other issue is the bomb making materials that you can buy in your local hardware store. Oh, yeah. Right. 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 So, you know, there's, there's all kind of very hard to. That's very, that's very, that's them. incredibly hard. But, but that will be, you know, yeah. as I say, if a weapon of war make, should not, not be in somebody's hands. It should not be in somebody's hands. That's, that's, I guess, that's, you know. Yeah. And if you're paranoid about the government and the, and the military, well, then you've got bigger problems. Because yeah. <laughs> I hear that. Well, the military's going to take us over. Yeah. I need to defend myself against the military. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, good luck. Oh, I know. I always get in certain cases. Well, part of this, Dave, is the reform.
reflection of how we, as a nation, utilize these weapons uh, on other countries and people, it's a reflection. It, all this is a reflection. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's not being talked about as a result. Uh, uh, Columbine. Yeah. Those kids were raised in a community that built nuclear missiles. Uh -huh. That was their consciousness. That's what, who knows what triggered them to shoot up that school. Maybe it was the overwhelming thought that we could blow up the whole planet. Maybe, because their parents went off to work to make nuclear triggers. I mean, there's a insanity that's related to all this. That's just my opinion. Yeah. I, mean, I, say, I just want to say one other thing. It bothers me the glory that is given in some mm, people's yes. mind mm -hmm. right. to these kids. When I saw the kid, yeah. the Fairhaven situation, there he is on the front of the Roman Herald right. several days in a row. Now, for some disturbed other kid who sees that yeah. and says, Ooh, look at this. Look at, this. Yeah. Look exactly. at the glory. It's the yeah. You know, yeah. it's really very disturbing. Now, I guess some some places and some papers have decided not to print the names, not to print a picture, not to give these people the glory that they get. No, because in, in those, the, those got, you know, people are watching. And the oh, story is repeated yeah. over. It's oh, pro oh. line news. Well, yeah. that's because you know, we have too much news. That's it, no, it's too much news. There's plenty of good news that nobody reports. That's right. right. Kill somebody here in Bethel Main it's, Street. We're going to be all over. It's one of the Good news doesn't it's stop. Who gets the yeah. ratings is what it's all about. So I'll tell you ratings, one thing. Yeah. I'm not a Mormon, but Heidi loves to watch Channel 374. And the, their uh, motto there is, see the good in the world. If we can try to focus on the good things that happen in, in the world, in our state, in our town, things will be different. But you look in the paper today, open it. See something, everything is negative. Yes, John. Yeah. Exactly. If you want to control something, try to control that. Yeah. Report good news. I, I agree with well, that. I, mean, I think a part of that's happening is because we have so much news coming out. 24 hour news. Yeah. Yeah. They have to fill hours of nothing. Because there's not enough news to fill. There's just it's, 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 over and over and over. It's over and yeah. over again. Yeah. So that I think what well, that like, I always thought that was a big problem. We have to go back to the you know six in the morning noon and six at night eleven. Yeah. For a half an hour that was it. Yeah, we're in Florida last year. Her uncle's house burned. We knew it when this house is on fire in Florida. So, so yes. Yeah. So this um, uh, seatbelt law, are you involved with that? Seatbelt law? Yeah, the one where the seatbelt oh, Primary seatbelt. stop. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of that? I'm not involved in it. I don't like it. I don't either. <laughs> we agree on something? Yeah. Fine. We agree on a lot of stuff. We just don't know it. Here, I have to tell you this story. This is crazy. Last week, I deliver meat for North Hollow Farm. I drive 300 miles every Wednesday. To all these stores and places. I'm in Colchester last week, and they have cameras and all those things. And I, with the weight of the truck and everything, I went through a light that quickly changed to red. You know, so I'm driving, driving, and all of a sudden I get pulled over. And I'm up high in a van, yeah. and this officer fish comes up to my window, and he said, uh, "How are you today?" I said, "Fine. How are you?" He said, "Do you know the reason I'm stopping you?" I said. I have no clue. I thought it was because he saw me just get through that light. He said, uh, a mile back, you were driving down the road with something light in your hand. And I'm like, what do you mean, the color? And I said, no, I'm looking at a pad of paper because that's where my directions are. Right? And he still insisted that I was texting. Now, I think what I'd like to put forth with regards to texting, I think it should be a $1,200 first time fee, first time charge to eliminate. I see the, the texting going on all over. Yeah. It is really bad. Yeah, but this officer, he actually thought you were texting. He thought I was texting. And I said, officer, that's my phone. It's a little flip phone. He said, may I have your license, please? I said, absolutely. He takes the license, comes back to the car. He goes, you know, I'm not going to give you a ticket. And I looked at him and I said, you know, while you were sitting in your cruiser, officer, I realized I don't even know how to text. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know how to text. And, 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 I, I, and I, my family is gigantic. They text, that, and I'm not, I said, I don't, I'll never text. I don't want to text. I, I so he's standing there looking at me. So I said, 
That is my little phone. It's a little flip phone. It's like 10 years old. And thank God he didn't put, put go into this intrusion of the seatbelt primary stop. It's scaring me from, from an intrusion thing. Well, I think the worry, um, the worry is that, you know, we, if it's a primary stop, then anybody at any time can be stopped. Oh. So, so I think that, um, I, I, what, I, is I the have, what is the primary? I don't primary know. stop means an officer can pull you over if he thinks you don't have your seatbelt. Oh, okay. In other words, now the seatbelt laws, they have to stop you for somebody else. If you don't have your seatbelt on, you can be cited for that. Well, I didn't have my seatbelt on the, with well, that sure officer. Don't, I know. <laughs> and he didn't notice. He didn't no, say you don't need to wear your seatbelt. But I think the, you know, the House passed it overwhelmingly. <clears throat> we haven't, it hasn't been taken up in the Senate, so I don't know what's going to happen there. But. Sandy's, the House passed it overwhelmingly. We, we did, um, but I understand that Senator Mazza doesn't like it, so it's not going to be that I heard he doesn't so, like it either. The uh, chair of yeah. Senate Transportation. Yeah. Why doesn't he like it? He says, it's it's, it's, he it's, says the same, same reason I say that anybody can be stopped for any, for yeah. as police officers decide they want to stop you, it can always be they don't think you ever see a on. And I, I think that if we have compliance, and we need to have a high rate of compliance in order to not have the hat. In other words, that most people are wearing seatbelts. So if you don't wear a seatbelt, wear one so you don't have to go to this. Yeah. Yeah. The number of distractions that are common are huge, and they're only getting, they're only increasing, and the speeds they were traveling at are increasing, right. and it's a, right. it's a terrible oh. equation. Oh, yeah. yeah. I see it on 89 during my meat deliveries. There's people at doing 80 miles an hour texting. Sure. Yeah. Or talking to somebody, or listening, yeah. listen, or, well, or singing that. along they, to the radio. They or, could or, still or. talk. They, you can still talk on your phone. Bluetooth. 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 Yeah. 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 But you've also got these cars with computer screens built right into the dashboard. Yeah, yeah. there's really a distraction. Yeah. 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 One, one car I passed uh, an SUV uh, two weeks ago, they were in the high speed lane, and they were both on, They were the driver and the passenger were both texting. To, I mean, to they, had cars, yeah. <laughs> they, had cars, they had cars lined up behind them. Yeah. They didn't even realize they were in the passing lane. They had yeah. about 10 cars. <laughs> Everyone's trying to pass, yeah. and they're both texting. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it is a problem. I can tell that we're just about done. Yeah. But I'd, I'd like to thank you for passing the coyote bill. Yeah. I, don't, I don't object to somebody being able to shoot an animal that's become a pest. Um, I'm not a hunter myself, um, but I, I think those contests are are, yes, are, are a terrible, are a terrible, terrible idea. It's not a game. This is something somebody protecting their property or their or their income. This is this is not something where people should be taking pleasure in how many animals they can shoot just because they happen to run across them in the countryside. And uh, I want to thank you for taking up the issue. So, but on the other hand. That. There's a lot of coyotes in our area, and it's really killing the small fawns out too. Yeah. So and and the small game, it's there hardly any anymore. Well, as I said, it's, it's always open season. Yeah. yeah. So, so does that? Does this no more kind of, Does how about when they deer hunt and they have a contest for the, the most points and most weight? Is that going to uh, fall for that? This this, this this doesn't doesn't touch. This doesn't only touch. touch this you, because a lot of this for the fundraisers. Yeah. You know, so. I know, but I didn't know if they went further than just coyotes. So. Don't give them any ideas. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> yeah, you're <laughs> Anything else? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for coming.